Welcome to the Liberty Alert with Gregory Seltz, sponsored by our friends at the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty here in Washington, D.C., a program that cuts through the chaos and confusion in the culture today by talking to kingdom citizenship, bold biblical principles for a robust public Christian life. And now your host, Dr. Gregory Seltz. Good day, good day, Washington, D.C., and friends of the program all around the country. I'm Gregory Seltz. Welcome to the Liberty Alert, where every week we try to cut through the noise and take on the issues, especially the public issues that matter to people of faith. You know, we try to rely on the wisdom of the Word for the sake of the culture and the mission of the church. Or as we like to say at the LCRL, we're trying to put our temporal liberties to work for the sake of the eternal liberties of God for all. And one of the ways that we try to do that, actually one of the ways uh, that we're privileged to do that, is to be here in Washington, D.C., and and to meet with the senators and to meet with the congressmen and meet with people of the executive branch and ask them questions about the issues that concern people of faith today and ask penetrating questions about that and see how they're handling those kinds of things. And then we try to bring that knowledge to you firsthand so that you can put that knowledge to work and be the kind of citizen that God wants you to be in Christ for others. That's why today we are privileged to have on our program Peter Roskam. He is, uh, as people say, he's an American politician, a uh, former U.S. representative for Illinois 6th Congressional District. He served from 2007 to 2019, but uh, Peter, you were more than just a congressman. You were also a congressman of, of note. I think you were the uh, the fourth ranking member, uh, at one time the chief deputy majority whip. So, you know, we're really privileged to have you on the program today to talk through some of these incredible things that are going on in our culture with you. So welcome. It's great to have you. Greg, it's great to be with you. And thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, so it, honestly... I'm a little bummed because I was just getting to know you. I really enjoy you. Uh, and I really would love to run by your office here at the Capitol and just sit down and talk with you about things. So it, it, it kind of it was a bummer to me that, that uh, 2020 was your last year of service here. First of all, how are you doing? Um, I know you're very, very busy and you're still involved in a lot of these things. But what's going on? Since then, well, since I uh, since I left Congress, I um, went to the University of Chicago, where I was a visiting fellow at the Institute of Politics for um, like one quarter, and it was so much fun. <clears throat> uh, completely counterintuitive. I thought it was going to be like Daniel in the lion's den and <laughs> yeah. like pushing back on the whole scene. And while you know it's a <clears throat> it's it's a liberal culture, and I'm a conservative, mm-hmm. the students that I interacted with were respectful to the point of being deferential. I mean, they were really, really good to me. And they came to my stuff and a lot of office hours and were really intellectually curious. And and I enjoyed that. And then after that, a couple of years ago, I I joined a big law firm. So I'm a partner in the law firm, Sidley Austin, and we've got offices around the world. And I split my time between Chicago and Washington. And right now in Chicago, you're saying it's it's finally becoming livable again. It's about 18 degrees or something, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> a couple of days ago, it was minus three. And I'm, I'm like screenshotting my weather thing, sending it to friends. Like, talk to the hand. I don't want to hear about your problems. It's minus three. And it was like, no joke. Now, today it's 20 and it's it's civilized. Well, um you know, I think actually we're getting the the nor'easters coming our way, so we, we're probably getting a little Chicago weather this weekend. Oh here yeah, in Washington. Man. Okay, well, you know that we're a religious liberty organization, and um, our our two main issues are obviously religious liberty, the sanctity of life, and for those of you who know our our second and our third and fourth thing are marriage, uh, the institution of marriage, and educational freedom. But those are religious liberty issues to us as well. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. This could be an incredible year in our culture. And what I mean by this is that we could be returning to a more traditional constitutional understanding of First Amendment protections for the church. I mean, we've got some big cases. Uh, We had the Bladensburg case, which was a foundational case for religious protection. And now we've got this main case for educational choice and then the Boston flag case. All in all, really what this means is that the church 
is actually uh, the, the First Amendment protections are, are going back more to that traditional, we're protecting the church from the government, not the government from the church. But from a legislator's point of view, let's say these things are all one and it, and it returns it to that. What does this mean from a legislative point of view? How do you see some of these cases and what it means for the church and the public square or even from the work of a legislator? I think what's going to happen, Greg, is a lot of the, you know, Congress or the, the, the courts, if, if they go in the direction that we hope that they're going to go, um, a, a lot of the pressure or the attention is going to turn towards legislative bodies. You know, right. take the life issue, for example. Um, the, the, the life issue, if it goes our way and if Roe v. Wade is struck down, as I hope it is, then um, what you'll see are a flurry of activity uh, around the uh, debate around abortion that will happen in all 50, in all 50 state capitals. Right. And so I, I think it, what, what I find interesting on these religious liberties questions is, and it, and it kind of comes up sometimes in the course of the pandemic um, and so forth, you realize how um, kind of tender and fragile these protections are. And in your right. lifetime and in my lifetime, We've operated on, on an assumption that has, you know, it's been kind of open field running for Christians, kind of like, hey, oh, yeah, like everybody, everybody agrees with the ability to have an influence in the public square and so forth. But within the past few decades, what we've seen is an erosion of those underlying assumptions, and we're, we're, we're currently operating a little bit more like first century Christians, you know, where, where Rome was pretty hostile and there's a level of hostility in our culture. And so now we've got an opportunity to, um, to, to reassert these things, but not for, for sharp elbowed reassertion. You know what I mean? This is not a selfish claim, these first amendment things. In fact, our founders recognized that our first, the, the freedom to worship, for example, is our first freedom. That's that that is the anchor upon which um, uh, or the foundation upon which our, our other freedoms um, flow. So it's a very consequential time. And if you've got your eyes open and you're, you're aware about what's going on in terms of these larger cultural trends, the, the court is basically looking as if it's going to do a big blocking maneuver for us to say, OK, we're going to we're going to restore these things or we're going to restore the space with which you can with which you can operate but you've got to be out there and protect the space nevertheless it's it's not like it's not like oh the work is done if these cases go the right way yeah and that's what i want to talk about next because yeah if these cases actually go our way the, it, that's like just being at the starting line that's uh, right absolutely but you know it's really interesting people seem to think that we're the ones trying to fight this stuff and 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 divide we're really just trying to get back to the dialogical way of dealing with these things rather than the coercive government getting in the way. Um, you know, right now there's a Finnish bishop uh, and a politician in Finland who are on trial. They're literally on trial right now because they teach publicly the Christian view of marriage and the Christian view of sexuality as within, within marriage. So male and female, and they could go to jail for two years. Uh, it looks like they're going to be fined if they lose the case. But that could be a fundamental thing. And when I tell people that there are forces trying to criminalize Christianity in the West, they look at me like, like you said, like uh, I've lost my mind. But in reality, those forces are here. There's stuff on platforms in the Equality Act that would do similar things to what's happening in Finland right now. So I think this could be an exciting year. You're right. This could be an exciting year where those protections are put back in place. But now I ask you this question, is the church ready? Uh, to be the moral voice in the culture, or a moral voice, not the necessarily, but we're called, God calls us to be a moral voice in the culture for the sake of the culture, and then, of course, to serve the gospel into people's lives. But we're called to do both of those things. And if we win all these cases, do you think we're ready for that? I don't know if we're ready. And I think that we had a little bit of a foreshadowing during the pandemic, for example. And and I will, I'll, I had a conversation that I'll share with you with a young pastor friend of mine who was into the, um, we should ch shut our church down motif. You know what I mean? And, and right. he came to that view sincerely. And I, and I spoke to him and I said, don't you get it? Don't you see that the agenda is to shut you down forever? 
Right. And I said, how is it, how can it be possible that, um, that abortion clinics are open, weed shops are open, you can buy alcohol, you can do all the, you can go to the gambling casinos in Illinois, but churches are under pressure to be closed. And I said, if you act like a non-essential entity, guess what? You are a non-essential entity. Right. And I said, this, you're not a social club. You're, you're the church. You're the, you're the body of Christ. <clears throat> and, and you've got to yeah. act and conduct yourself differently. And he, it was like a revelation. And he, he was like, oh, my word, I never, I never thought of it that way. And, yeah. and then, you know, he, his disposition changed. But here's my concern. And it's kind of a subtext of what you and I are dancing around. It's like, are, is the church ready for this? Is the church you know, capable. And, and it's kind of an open question right now. I, I think how we conducted ourselves sometimes in the pandemic um, demonstrates, uh, you know, just a, a, an attitude to be intimidated. Well, and on top of that, you know, I, and I'll, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this position is I get a chance to go out and teach too, like, but more to teach the lay people, teach the church, and I'm, I'm amazed at, at their hunger. I'm amazed at their wisdom. A lot of these folks know what to do, but they also want people like us who are in the middle of this mix to come and say, well, here's, here's what you got to deal with. You know, we'll tell it to you straight. And I find that, that there are some people who want to fight, but then I say, but what are you fighting for? You're, you're fighting just to make sure that we're all at the starting line. That's not the ultimate goal of the church. But yeah, there are some things we're going to have to stand for this. We're going to have to fight for this. And then there's people who want to serve. And it's almost like either or. And I'm saying, no, we're going to have to learn how to do both and for the sake of others. And, and you know, that's a lot harder. It, it's easy to say what I just said, but it is yeah. a lot harder to do because, you know, we fight and then that's all we want to do is fight or we serve. And that's all we want to do is serve. And God calls us to do both. For the yeah, sake it's a little of bit of kind of Nehemiah action, isn't it? Yeah. You're on the wall and you gotta be, you gotta be armed and on the wall and building at the same time that you're armed. And, right. and, um, <clears throat> I think and calling people to a, a different kingdom that has nothing to do with this, but, but if all hell breaks loose in this kingdom, it's hard to share the good news of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like what you were saying that, you know, uh, he didn't see that the church is an, we were fighting for that, that the church is an essential organization and people say, well, how do you mean by that? It's in the First Amendment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, an essential organization. Well, then what's it for? Well, it's to be the moral voice in the culture for the sake of the culture. And that means even pushing back on government overreach and stuff like that that we saw in the pandemic. Uh, in Chicago, right. I, I talked about this. There was there was an urban, because I'm an urban guy. I've been in urban ministry for 30 years. There was a, a African-American church that kept worshiping. And I think your mayor sent the cops, they sent the police and they were putting $500 fines on it and they banged on the church door. And finally they said, how come you locked us out? They said, well, we always keep the door locked to prevent gangs from coming in while we're worshiping. Uh, to us, we are like, that's just what we do. You're not gonna stop us from worshiping. But it was amazing how she wanted to shut them down. And they were one of the most positive forces in that neighborhood, so. Of course, there's another story like that in Chicago, Elam Romanian Pentecostal Church on the Northwest side. And the pastor saw it. He, you know, he, he, you know, born and raised in Romania, communism, you right. know what I mean? He knew what was going on. He knew the agenda. And he said, we are not shutting down and went toe to toe with the governor, prevailed, forced the governor to, uh, to back off. This was, uh, went all the way, not in a formal case, but all the way in proceedings before Justice Kavanaugh at the court who had jurisdiction over, over this matter. And the state of Illinois, the governor of Illinois backed off and his executive order said religious organizations are exempt. And it was all because of the guts of this Romanian, uh, Elam Romanian Pentecostal church. God bless these guys, man, did they see it? They understood it and they didn't back down. And they weren't, they weren't, you know, there was no bravado here. There was no provocation. Right. And it reminds me a lot, Greg, of, um, you know, one of the, one of the most interesting things is when you look at um, John Paul II, when he right. was, um, when he was cardinal <clears throat> and he made the Polish communists absolutely crazy because he was provocative in that 
his provocation was that he wouldn't back down. Right. So they tried to intimidate him. They tried to do all these sorts of things and he wouldn't back down. And by not backing down, that was the provocation. And he, of course, God used him as somebody who changed the course of history. Well, and I love, I, I always tell the story about John Paul because I, I really liked him a lot too. I've read a lot of his stuff. He would always come out and put a cross in the middle of the city square and start doing mass. And then of course yeah. the communists would come and grab his cross and you know this. And then the next Sunday he'd come right out and put another cross in the middle of the city square right. and do mass. And I just thought, yeah, because you're you're the body of Christ. You're in this world for the sake of the world. You're trying to bring Christ, but God also uses good government to keep things peaceful so that the people can hear about Christ and Christians need to be a part of both of those that's efforts. Right. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, like I said, I, I really have enjoyed starting to, to talk these things with you too, because I know you get it. And, and as a Christian in government, I guess that's what I want to talk a little bit about too, because I think, again, we tend to have this uh, either or mindset, either you're, either government's going to solve all our problems, and there are people like that on the Hill, they tend not to be Christians who talk like that. Um, and Or else you have the, the Christians who say, well, let's let the government take care of that, that's not really our business. And so you and I both know that there are callings for Christians to come serve in these places. That's what right. was it like to be a Christian, you know, in government? What were the challenges? What were the opportunities? What are some of the successes? And, and how, how would you, rec you know, what would you say to someone who might be even contemplating uh, jumping into this mess? Well, I would encourage them to jump into the mess um, okay. and jump in, jump in the water's fine. It may look a little <laughs> bubbly and murky, but, but you'll be okay. And look, it brought me a lot of joy. I spent um, a dozen years representing a constituency on Capitol Hill. I was down in the Illinois legislature for <clears throat> uh, about an equivalent amount of time before that. So about 25 years in public life. And um, I will say that, um, you know, one of the, one of the things I think is, is <clears throat> to try and discern the, um, the substance of the law and, and the process of the law. The lawyers who are listening, they'll understand substantive due process and procedural due process. Okay, this is not a due process lecture, but it is, a, it is to begin to think through, um, all right, there's certain ways in which, there's certain issues that are fundamental issues. And the ones that you talked about at the top of our conversation, Greg, religious liter liberties, right to life, marriage, family, and so forth. Those are really foundational. And in my view, they, they are, they're, 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 they're really clear about where a Christian ought to be. Okay. There are other things that aren't in that category. You know what I mean? Right. Like how much money you spend on roads or, you know, and to be able to discern sort of the difference be between the two. And then also to be thinking about how do you carry yourself? As a follower of Jesus, how do you conduct yourself? How are you reflecting his love for people who were around you, who were opposed to you on, on, on different issues? And so therein lies, I think, part of the uh, part of the challenge that that we have. And I will say, I had um, I had the benefit of a wife who uh, my wife Elizabeth encouraging praying, you know, she would say, you know, when I'm, hey, go out and 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 do your thing. And it's like Rocky when the music's coming out. You know what I mean? You, when your wife says, I was like, okay, you know, I was like, let's go. And um, really, really just a, a, an unbelievable partner and encourager to me. And then um, my family prayed for me. And I had a, we had a group of people that would pray um, we would meet periodically, a physician friend in town here in, in Wheaton. We would um, gather, you know, just a group that would that would pray for protection and wisdom and insight. And um, we did that <clears throat> probably once a quarter as a prayer meeting around us uh, and our protection for our family, uh, you know, for four or five times a year for for all 12 years I was in, in Congress. So wow. to have people, my mother would send out a letter to, to her friends to, to have people pray. And I know that people were praying. I know that I was spared situations and not put in situations by the grace of God. <clears throat> um, 
And I'm well, you know, that providential, and again, that's one of the things that, that really bothers me about where we are today is that the providential nature of God's activity in even our culture, that's something our founding fathers not only believed in, they thought it was essential to, to liberty. And that's one of the things that we do. We're not just on the hill to advocate for certain things. We're also on the hill to encourage and to be that kind of prayer aspect in people's lives. We try to meet with this. this we start with Lutheran ed folks on the hill, but anybody who aspires to these things and partners with us, we try to gather and pray for them because like you said, the stuff that you guys have to deal with on the hill, my goodness, there's all kinds of pressure on people. When I saw some of the stuff that was happening in the last couple of years where people were going to events and they were walking back and they were being accosted by crowds just because they were legislators. And I thought, Lord, they've got to be afraid for their families. They have to be troubled by these things. Um, and this was happening on a regular basis, not just January 6th. People think that's it. No, it was happening. People were being, you know, put upon. And I thought, my goodness, what a tough position to be in just because you espouse a certain position. So, yes, we pray. And that's a great thing. But I love what you just said, too, about trying to teach people about the, the government, the substance, the process. I would add, and what do you think about this? The proper expectation. Because oh. too many people think that that passing all these laws is going to no passing good laws prevents bad things, but actually changing and transformation that does not come from law like we know and, and from the scriptures point of view that comes from free people serving caring and loving one another and no government can ever do that better than average people right. Oh, Greg, that's really well said, and I think <clears throat> to just kind of build on that a little bit there there's. We are all subject to um, a, a cultural pressure of instant gratification. And I put myself at the top of this list. Everybody who's listening to us right now, if they're self-aware, they're like, we all want what we want when we want it. And, you know, I look at my iPhone and if it, the little thing spins for 10 seconds of loading, I'm like, oh, this thing's junk. What, what is, what's with this garbage? Okay, it's ridiculous. But that has completely saturated our culture. Now, here's where it becomes significant in this discussion. We have a, a system of governance that is not designed to get things done. Our system of governance is designed to restrain power. Right. Why? Because most of the founders, even the ones that weren't Christians, they understood they understood human nature and they understood fallen human nature. And so they created this system that we're so familiar with, but it's so elegant three co-equal branches of government that are highly suspicious of one another, that are in perpetual tension with one another. That is not an express lane to get things done. Now, here's where it gets super interesting to me. Thomas Jefferson, 14 years after he authored the Declaration of Independence. So in 1790, he writes to a guy named Charles Clay, who is a pastor. <clears throat> and I'll give you three lines, of four lines of this letter. But think of this, because it, it's important contextually. Jefferson understood the big picture. He understood um, vision and big ideas and moving things quickly. He was the author of the Declaration of Independence. But listen to a very different tone 14 years later. He said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We must be content with what we can get from time to time and eternally press on for what is yet to get. It takes time to persuade men even to do what is for their own good. Okay, now you take that concept and overlay it on our culture, and it begins to explain a lot. It's like, look, even on our side of, of these issues, a conservative worldview, we have an expectation that, well, hey, just elect the right people, and boom, it's done. It's all, <clears throat> it's all, it's all handled based on one election, or what do you mean you can't balance the budget in two years? Come on, I can do that. Well, okay, Sparky, you give it a shot. Here, here, try this. But you take my point that it's a it's it's an incrementalism that we're kind of uncomfortable with, and yet we live our own lives incrementally. We save money incrementally. We lose weight incrementally. We work out incrementally. We build our businesses incrementally, and yet somehow. We have an expectation with government that it's either going to change and everything instantly or it's all going to be a disaster instantly. And I think we've got to settle in to be far more incremental in how we approach it. 
Yeah. And I, you know, what I always try to tell people too, is we're going to have to understand too, how a lot of the Christian worldview principles actually undergird a lot of what you're talking about. I even say when someone came at me one time and said, oh, separation of church and state. And I said, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. And they go, I'm not a Christian. I said, well, that notion of what we call it the differentiation of church and state, not separation. Even if you do separation, it's to protect the church, not the state. I said, uh, that's a Christian worldview. You know, that comes from the New Testament, but that both of these branches, uh, the church and the state, are essential elements in our society. That's a Western thing. I said, because most there are the theocrats out there and there are secularists out there. And the, the secularists think that the church is meaningless and the, the church theocrats think that the government's pretty useless, too. We're the only ones that say that both of them are important from God's point of view. So, yeah, I didn't know you were a Christian. And I think we need to learn more about how our worldview really does undergird a lot of the tolerance, a lot of the freedom, a lot of the things that people cherish. And we should be able to defend those things in the public square, again, not for our sake, but for the sake of all. So, And look, like it said, really goes back, it really goes back to Jesus teaching in the Gospel of Mark, where the Pharisees tried to trick him and, and showed him the coin and so forth. And he obviously said, in the famous, the, the, the famous teaching, render unto Caesar what is what Caesar, Caesar, to God what is God's. Right. And there was, you know, there's been subsequent commentary on that that has said, in that moment, Jesus gave um, a sacredness to government that didn't exist before and a protection against government. You know what I mean? It was right. so obviously, it was right. divine. So obviously, it was just an incredible insight. But there is, I, I think that's a foundation uh, upon which we can we can build. And I love that because uh, Jesus later on says to, you know, when he's being uh, judged by Pontius Pilate, he said, Pilate in essence said, I can do whatever I want to. And he said, nah, you really can't. <laughs> you know, well, you're, you're limited to only, <laughs> only what the, so we always teach when it comes to government, don't say WWJD, which is what would Jesus want you to do and go, we say, what would the father want you to do to do good government so that you can hear what mm. Jesus did uh, for you? So, hey, listen, I, I love talking to you today. Uh, would you come back again sometime? And I'd be we'll delighted. Talk? What a joy. Yeah, Thanks it'd be great. Me. And uh, thanks for having me. There's going to be some things that are going to be very, very particular, and only a person who's got that inside out knowledge uh, it, it can help us <laughs> work through these things as Christians who just want to be free to, to share the gospel with others. So, again, Peter, thanks for being on our program today. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for tuning in today. To get to know our LCRL DC work better, check out our website at lcrlfreedom.org. Contained there are resources to empower your public square dynamic discipleship. Or check out our weekly Word from the Center opinion piece every Friday at facebook.com forward slash LCRL freedom. Till next time, God bless you always. I'm Gregory Seltz. Have a great week. You've been listening to Liberty Alert with Dr. Gregory Seltz, Executive Director of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. This program has been brought to you by the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty.